Um, I'm Ian Barber, as uh, uh, Marco said. Uh, I work for Virgin, and I'm talking about ZeroMQ. Uh, and this is the first time I've done this talk, uh, and I really like this library. I think it's really, really cool. So I'd love to hear your feedback on what you thought was good about the talk, about the library, anything. Uh, joined in is an excellent place for that. So um, ZeroMQ is a project that makes people sort of say things like this. Um, and that's a bit weird. Uh, it's a bit of a full-on thing. It's uh, zero MQ is unbelievably cool. If you haven't got a project that needs it, make one up. And that's by a, a guy called uh, uh, John Gifford from, from a site called Logly that do very large-scale log aggregation for cloud systems. And they're using zero MQ right now at a very high level of traffic. Um, he, he loves it. And I think that's the reaction I've found from almost everyone that spent time working with zero MQ. And I think the reason that you get that reaction is because ZeroMQ lets you do a very difficult thing pretty simply, and that's build distributed systems. Now, if anyone has ever looked at any MQ, something MQ, then they probably think of a, a, a system that is a, sort of a message queue, something that sits in the middle of your network and will help you solve a problem. And that's not what ZeroMQ is. ZeroMQ is not a daemon. ZeroMQ is not a server. ZeroMQ is a library. Um, and ZeroMQ is a way that you plug things together. It has the ability to be a message queue. It has the ability to be a lot of different things. But it's primarily a socket system that allows you to do concurrency, queuing, and high availability. ZeroMQ is really a series of multiple queues that talk to each other. And these different points that are talking to each other, they could be two different machines on a network. They could be two different processes within one machine. They could be two different threads within one process, or they could be any mix of those. So the way that ZeroMQ is built is around patterns. And the way that you tend to implement it is around a slightly higher level of patterns. So on the left-hand side here, we've got three patterns that we're going to look at today. A queue, a pipeline, and publish, subscribe. And on the right-hand side, you've kind of got extensions of that, uh, an ESB, an enterprise service bus. Have you ever encountered one of those? They're basically a fancy queue. If you ever encountered async, well, async's really just a kind of pipeline process. And at the bottom, that complex one, that's a gateway. Well, that's a forwarder. Sometimes it's a, a message distribution, something like PubSub. But the easiest way to understand why ZeroMQ works and why it's useful and why it's going to solve problems for you, I hope, is to look at some code. So this is um, about the simplest thing that you can do with any network system, a request response. It's sending a message, getting a reply. It's client server. It's exactly what happens with uh, almost every service that we use at the moment. And uh, in ZeroMQ, you can kind of write how you think you should be able to write for almost any socket library. So you always have a context with ZeroMQ. And that first line that you maybe can see, anyone at the back can see that? A little bit. OK. That first line is creating where the global state for zero MQ lives. Uh, the reason it has that is because if you include a library that already uses zero MQ, it won't break. They'll happily interoperate without giving you problems. Then you create a socket. And a socket is just either a receiving or a sending part of one of these bits of communication. And you have a type. So in this case, we're saying socket rep. That's a reply socket. So this is the server. We then bind it to an address. So binding is just like listening on a port, because we're going to bind to a TCP uh, address here. And in fact, we're just going to bind to any TCP address that's on the box. So any interface that's on there, it will listen on, and it will listen on that port. Now, binding um, needs to have access to the port. So if you start Apache on port 80 and then try and bind uh, a zero MQ socket on port 80, it will complain. Once you've got it bound, though, all you have to do is call receive, and it's going to uh, trigger every time there's a message. So receive will block. Receive will wait until there's a message for it to receive. And the message just looks like a PHP string. And to reply, you just do the opposite. You send. So in this case, we're waiting for a message, and then we're sending out world. The client, just about the same thing. We're doing a rec socket rather than a rep socket. That's a request. And we're doing a connect rather than a bind, because we don't um, we don't control this socket type, we're just a client of it. So we're connecting to that socket. So if, say, we have you know, Apache running on that port on there, sorry, um, it will still work. 
this connect is not going to do anything until it needs to send data. And the send and the receive just look exactly the same as the server case. Um, it's very, very simple. And you're just, again, sending a string, getting it back. But what makes this cool is, is actually how that, how that works in practice. So we should try um, and show you something. Uh, so here we have uh, a request. So we're just going to run the request. This is exactly the code you saw before. We're just doing a And this is just going to sit there happily, because at the moment, there's nothing there to listen to that request. And hopefully, oh, wrong window. Uh, we're going to run the reply. So this is the server. Again, exactly the same. This immediately replies. So zero and queue doesn't require you to start your stuff in any particular order. It will happily let you work as you need to. And it will happily serve multiple things. So if we down the bottom here, we've got a slightly different version of this request that's just going to let us define uh, a name, and it's going to let us define a time. So effectively, all we're going to be doing here is um, sending messages once per second. So it's just, sending, it's just bringing up a message here saying, sending second type, hello world. If we send another request through, it gets handled. You don't have to do anything else. It knows there are multiple connections coming in. It handles it. The nice thing about it is the way that it handles it if things go a bit faster. So if we do, well, something like this. So in this case, we're only going to wait 500 uh, microseconds. So this one is going to send a lot more queries. In the middle window now, our server window, you cannot see any of the second thing. But if you look, the time's still ticking up because zero and queue is not going to let one flood out the other. If there's a message waiting from this other connected socket, it's going to fairly queue it. So you're never going to be able to starve off uh, one service, one client, by having a really busy client that's sending lots of data, which is really cool. It means that you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. The library handles it for you. And we can bring it up and down in any order. We've got a lot of flexibility in terms of how we um, start and control our services. Yeah. yeah. So what happens if the server can't handle that much traffic because it needs to do lots of processing? Does it all get queued? Absolutely. So if, the, if there is, in that case, we're just chucking out a message. But if we had to do a lot of work, then um, the receive part of it is actually handled in a background thread. So the receive would be put onto a queue. Um, so we will just sit there and queue up messages until we've done it. It'll, the client will happily be able to send. Of course, the question that you get then is, what if you just send too much? Um, and you can control in zero MQ how much can be in the queue at any given point. And then on the sending side, when it cannot send anymore, it'll just block. So you can have your clients send as much as they need to up until the point where the, the uh, server says, I, I can't take any more, and it'll block on the server side. So you get uh, quite a lot of control in how you design that edge case, that failure case. So the other thing that's nice about ZeroMQ is because this is a library and it's used in everything, you can write your servers in anything. This is an example in Python. I was going to do one in Java, but life was too short. So <laughs> uh, this is really straightforward. And you can see it's exactly the same thing, server receive, send in a message. It's just using a Python string. And that happily maps, because ZeroMQ doesn't try and do too much to any of the messages it sends. So um, ZeroMQ was actually developed by uh, a company called iMatics. It's open source, LGPL. And um, they built it really for financial systems. So this is used for stock markets, um, for people doing high volume trading and stuff like that. So it's designed to be scaled across thousands of cores, handling millions of messages. That was its creative function. Um, the PHP extension was actually developed by this guy, who's over there. Um, and uh, that's Miko Kopanen. He's, uh, he's behind the uh, iMagic extension and a whole bunch of other extensions that you, you may have encountered. Um, and so it's a, it's a rock solid extension, works really, really nicely. Miko's also the build maintainer now for ZeroMQ, which um, means actually we have really great snapshots of ZeroMQ available for Windows. Um, so if you have a look at snapshots.zeromq, if you happen to be working on Windows, there's uh, great builds available there. But Everyone else, about the best way to install ZeroMQ if you want to use it is to do the configure, make, make, install with the latest version of the website. Um, it is in package management. You can get it in an Ubuntu PPA. You can get it in a Fedora repo, but it's a little older. Um, this latest version came out on Wednesday and is well worth using. There's some really great improvements in there. <coughs> to install the extension, you can do that straight through Pear. So um, if anyone can't see the... Uh, 
uh, the actual commands there, they are on the ZeroMQ site, ZeroMQ.org, and also these slides will be up afterwards, so they should be pretty easy to get. So that initial uh, communication we did, the client server, that um, was pretty straightforward. It's not complex. But it did hide a lot of the stuff that ZeroMQ does under it. And it did also bring up this problem of, okay, so we've got messages going to this server, but what if the server can't handle all the load? What if it can't do uh, enough processing in time? What if we need more than one server? What is the best way to do that? And um, that's really the classic message queue problem. And we'll, we'll look at that in a little bit, but first we have to understand what does it mean by message and queue. So messaging in zero and queue has a pretty specific uh, set of things that go with it. A message is atomic. So when you send it, you receive it or you don't. If it's one gigabyte long, you receive it or you don't. You don't have to worry about that from a programming point of view. You get the message or you don't get the message. Um, all the reliability is handled by zero MQ internally. That is not something you have to concern yourself with. And that message is really just a string of bytes. Um, <clears throat> if you've done any TCP socket programming, you might be used to a stream of bytes. So you've really got to work out where it ends, where the client's not going to send you anymore. That is never true in zero MQ. Zero MQ knows how long the message it's sending is, and you do not get any more than that. So you can just receive, you get your whole message. And it doesn't do much to those uh, strings. It will put a very small framing protocol around them, but if you send a 10K message, what will go on the wire is a bit over 10K. If you send a 10 meg message, what will go on the wire is a bit over 10 meg. So it's very efficient. It's not gonna uh, add a lot of stuff and a lot of overhead because it's used for these very high volume uh, financial systems. And finally, it's multi-part. And that doesn't sound like it's necessary so much use when you can just send you know, whatever, because people would use JSON or Google po protocol buffers or whatever they want to actually send messages. But multi-part is useful because ZeroMQ itself can use the different parts of the message, which lets you build things like envelopes, which are very useful for routing, which as you get into more complex systems, allow you to send messages different ways from within ZeroMQ. Queuing is the other part of it. And both of these things are queues. So we have a post office queue. Uh, people uh, are waiting in a snaking queue to go and speak to someone at a desk. And that's a very traditional queue. It looks like a bad thing because there's a lot of people waiting, but it's a good thing because if everyone went to the desks at once, the tellers wouldn't be able to serve anyone. There would just be too much going on, everyone would be shouting at them. So this is actually restraining the amount of work that's available to them to the amount they can handle. So only one person is being dealt with at a time. So this works, but it means everyone's having to wait. They're having to sit there because they need a reply. The post box is a queue as well, and maybe the post box is a better queue. Because with a post box, you just go in and drop your letter off, and it's done. You don't have to wait for a reply. You just drop it, and you leave. And the post box is only finite. It can fill up, and I'm sure you've seen around Christmas, sometimes post boxes do fill up, and you just simply can't put any more letters into them. That can be solved by having someone visit the post box and empty it more regularly. But the post box is providing a buffer, and that's another kind of queue. And in zero MQ, we have queues kind of built in. So whenever the client is sending, it can queue stuff. So you can send right away. It can just queue on its internal queue. And on the receiver, we will also have a queue. But sometimes we want something in the middle or extra queues to allow us more flexibility. Because queues really are the basis of being able to do things asynchronously. If you've uh, ever written much JavaScript, then um, you'll know that when you do a callback, uh, you do an AJAX function, you just do it, it just goes. It happens immediately. That's what asynchronous means. It's, it, you're not waiting on what that resource is doing, but there's still limited resource. Uh, in this, I just had a little JavaScript that was just going away and doing an AJAX call to a PHP script that just slept for 10 seconds. Didn't do much. But I would do 20 of them. To my, from my point of view, from the programming point of view, I can just go call, 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 call. It's fine. But underneath, um, Firefox will only send six at once to a given domain. It has a limited resource it can use. So it has to hold the others in a queue until it's ready to process them. <coughs> this means that we get nice flexible behavior um, even though the engine underneath is doing something more complex. And that's exactly the kind of thing we want to be building into our applications with ZeroMQ. So ZeroMQ architectures are about building lots of smart edges. Things at the end that do stuff. Clients and servers and things that know stuff. And in the middle, 
having a lot of dumb things, a lot of dumb queues, a lot of dumb routers, stuff that can send messages and hold messages and not really process messages, much like the internet. The idea is that you can take a sending part and a receiving part and you can drop stuff in between it. So here we're dropping a queue in between it and most of the time when you look at traditional messaging middleware, message queues, they'll look like this bottom option. There'll be a queue in the middle and the queue will have stuff sent to it and it will go out. But that means that you've kind of got this big hefty device in the middle of your network, which is not always what you want. With zero MQ, because it's so easy and cheap to build a queue, you often put the queue, well, let's say you have one machine that has a local queue, everything's pushing to that, and then it's talking to a server. Or you have a server with a bunch of workers on it, and they have a local queue, and everything's pushing to that. Or you have both. It's very, very cheap and easy to build them, so you don't have to worry about chucking extra ones in. And the queue itself is very straightforward. So this is the sort of canonical message queue example. It's a little bit more complicated than the other one, but not, not by much. Um, we're connecting two sockets. So we're connecting a front end, where we're going to receive from the client, and we're connecting a back end, where we're going to send out to all the workers. And just like before, we're binding on some TCP ports. We're using a slightly different uh, uh, socket type. Rather than using rec and rep, we're using xrep and xrec. And these, do, these work in the same way. They'll let you talk to reply and request sockets, but they're a bit more intelligent. So xrep is a kind of router. When it gets a message, it will put it in an envelope using the multi-part thing so that it knows where to send the reply back to. And rec, xrec, is a dealer. So it will automatically distribute between all connected peers, which means that you can do exactly what you want to do, have any number of clients, any number of servers, and they can all just plug into this, this point. We're going to use a poll in order to let us listen for anything that's happening, because before we were just doing receive. So receive is fine, but receive is going to block. So let's say we're receiving on the front end, nothing happens, but we can have replies coming back on the back end. We wouldn't know about them. So poll lets us basically listen on both of those sockets at the same time. And then finally, we got a couple of flags, because we have to detect whether these messages are multi-part, and 0MQ does that by just having a couple of uh, flags you can check. Uh, they just say mode, send more, and sock opt, receive more. So the actual code, it's, it looks a bit long, but actually this whole block is exactly the same as this whole block. Um, you, can, you can about half the length of this code, but it's just to make it a bit clearer. At the top, we're looking for uh, any event. So we're just going on our poll and we're saying, if I hear an event on the front end or the back end, let me know. When we get it, we say, if it's a front end, we receive all the parts of it. So we have a little do while loop where we're just picking out each part and then we're just gonna send those out to the back end. So all we're gonna do is shuffle messages from the front to the back. And then the other bit, we're just shuffling messages from the back to the front. All the clever stuff of routing it back to the right place is handled by x -Rep. All the clever stuff of pushing it out and load balancing amongst available workers is handled by x -Rep. So that's very, very simple for us. Now, the poll is kind of a cool part of this. And poll is, polling is a lot more interesting than just being able to listen on zero MQ sockets. When you poll something, you can poll anything that in Unix has a file descriptor, which is anything, really. Um, so we can have a poll that's listening on 0MQ sockets, that's listening on a network socket, so we're waiting for some TCP data. Or we can listen on standard in. We can listen on almost anything. So this uh, is a little example where we're going to do a new socket, so we're just listening over 0MQ, uh, of a pull type of pull socket, we'll look at that in a little bit. And we have a standard in. So we're just going to do an F open on standard in, as you would any time you just wanted to receive console input. The poll is then going to add both of those. So even though only one of those is a 0MQ socket, we add them to the 0MQ polling function with no problem. And then finally, we're just going to echo out which one it is. So, hopefully, if we run the poll, then type something, it picks up from standard in. So pretty straightforward, we're just going through and looking at standard in. Then we have another uh, little script over here, and all this is doing is pushing to that 0MQ socket that we saw before. All this code, incidentally, um, is up on GitHub. There's a link at the end, so uh, you can take a look. So we can just do hi, and it comes across 0MQ. So this one poll loop can easily look for events happening anywhere else. So if you had a file that was being updated, you could look for events on that file. Um, if you had another sort of stream that you needed to see whether anything was happening, you could easily do that through uh, zero MQ as well.
So the other thing that the queue brings up is, and I'm sure some people have already thought of, that that queue is fixed. It's a stable point in the architecture. And whenever you're looking at building a large distributed architecture, you have to think about what's stable and what's unstable. Now, stable sounds like the good thing, but stable is equivalent to limited or fixed or single point of failure. Unstable sounds like a bad thing, but that's dynamic or elastic. It's a good thing. So in general, you want as much of your architecture as possible to be dynamic. And in our queue example, all our clients, dynamic. They can come and go as they please. All of our workers, they're also dynamic. If a server goes away, we don't care. If it comes back, if two more come back, if five more come back, we're happy. But we have the queue as this sort of fixed point in the middle of it. What Xerum Queue allows you to do to get around that is you can actually bind and connect to multiple sockets. So from our client, we can connect to our queue. But we can connect to two queues, and then we'll just bounce messages across both of them. So we can build in redundancy if we need to. But it's also always worth considering when looking at one of these architectures, which bit's stable, which bit's fixed, and which bit's dynamic, which bits uh, are we going to be able to scale elastically. So the uh, uh, little polling request there used the pull socket. And the pull socket is part of a, a pattern called pipelining. And you can see that's one-way communication. So this is very common for work distribution. Um, anytime you're pushing uh, work out to be done by a bunch of workers, you're in fact sending one-way messages from a server out to a lot of workers, out to a lot of clients. You don't want to reply, you're just sending it out. Something like a MapReduce framework really is doing that. You're firing off a lot of mappers, and then they're going all in to a reducer. They're sending data one way. Um, and that's something that we can do with the pull and push uh, socket types in Zero MQ. So let's say that we wanted to do something like, it could be sending a bunch of emails, because we know that email sending is kind of slow. So we don't want our one PHP process to be doing it. We want lots of PHP processes. But if we have that, we have to send work out to them. In this, we've got a bit of a simple, uh, it's just going to count up a string length. But what we're going to do is spawn off a bunch of workers. So what we're going to do is just fork and run a PHP worker. So this script will start uh, 10 instances of the work.php script. And then we're going to set up some sockets. We're going to set up a worker socket, which is a push type. So we're going to be sending it out. And we're going to send up a control socket, which is another push type. So we're going to be, this is sort of us sending messages out to whoever's listening. And uh, we are going to bind both of those. But rather than binding them to a network port as we were before, we're binding them to an IPC named pipe. So this allows us to do very fast, basically across memory communication um, on almost any Unix system. There is a Windows uh, name pipe support in ZeroMQ coming probably in the summer. Um, this needs to have a file location that the name pipe will go through. So we're just putting a couple in temp. But this means that this all is all going to work on one machine. So rather than working across the network as we were before, we're now distributing work just within one machine because uh, we know that we just need multiple processes because they're going to be waiting, not because we need to fan out to lots of different machines. But if we did need to fan out to different machines, this would be easy to replace with TCP. All you have to change are those two bind lines. So then we're going to do our actual work. And all that's going to do is read in all the lines of a file and just send them through that socket. And that socket will fairly distribute to all connected workers. So we know that each of them are going to do about the same amount of work. The work is pretty straightforward as well. Um, all we have to do here is connect pulls to the pushes we connected before. So we have a pull for our work socket. We have a pull for our control socket. And we also have a push um, out to our results. So we're sort of fanning out from one point to many workers. But then we want the results to fan back in to one result collector, which we're going to call sync. And all of these are connects. So because they're connects, this is not a stable part of the architecture. This is unstable. This is dynamic. So if we want 20 workers, no problem. They're all connecting to things. They're not binding to any of them. We're going to use a poll again. But in this case, we're not polling both those sockets. We're going to use the poll so we can have a timeout. And actually doing the work is very, very straightforward. We're just going to do a poll. If we get a message, we're going to receive. And the main reason of having the poll is that we can have a little timeout there. And if there's no messages for a while, the poll will time out, and we'll go and see if there's any control messages for us on the control socket. And we're doing that just so that we prioritize the work socket ahead of the control socket. If the control socket, we don't want to be sitting there waiting for a message because we're using receive. So we're just going to pass it a flag that says don't block. If there's a message waiting for you, 
give me it. But if there's no message waiting for you, just exit. And what it'll actually do is, is chuck in a, um, an exception, so we'll capture. And then finally, we got the sync. So all we were doing in this thing is just calculating the string length of the message that was passed in. So it's a trivial bit of work. Um, and here, we're just going to connect two sockets, the result socket and the uh, control socket. And we're just going to do pretty much the same code as the worker, pull everything in, and when we get to the when we get the control message saying, end, you're done, it'll just output the total length. It's not that interesting to see that one run, so uh, it's just a little bit of output. All it will do is start the workers, send the messages in and out, and collect them. Now, this is a pretty trivial example, and you could use something like this, maybe for doing something like sending emails. But real pipeline systems tend to get a lot more complex and have a lot more sockets, because what pipeline gives you is the ability to fan out and in at any point that makes sense for you. So let's say that you have uh, some sort of image processing pipeline. All the different parts of it are going to need have different requirements. So you might start with images are uploaded. So images go into a certain point and they're uploaded for processing. But you then need to scale out so that you can re-encode them, maybe from one format to another. That's taking a bit longer. You need more machines. So maybe you scale out across TCP. Then you need to fan those back in, because you're doing some quantizing, which is actually just happening on one machine. It's a lot cheaper. And uh, that's maybe two processes on a single machine. You might have a validation point, and you insist everything going through this one process for validation. And then you fan out and go to some watermarking. This is the kind of thing that you can do, putting together a lot of different steps and a lot of different scale requirements very easily, because at any given point, you're just connecting to a socket and sending a message across it. And that message can even be the image. We don't have to go out to another file system if we don't want to. But there was a bit of a hack in that last example where we had, um, <coughs> when we ended the sockets, we would send an end message. And we would have to send it 11 times, once for each worker and then once for the sync. That's not very good because now our um, sending system has to know how many um, other scripts it's got connected. That's very fragile. We don't want that. And it has to do that because when we send, say, from our validator out to here, if we send one message, it will go out to one. The next message to the next one, next message to the next one, and so on. It's only going to send to one node at a time. And what we want is to be able to send the same message to any number of nodes at the time. And that's what the pub sub publish subscribe pattern is for. It's kind of like a, it's a broadcast message. Uh, and much like a radio broadcast, pub sub, you can just send stuff out to it. If no one's listening, the messages just disappear. So it's not going to wait for someone to connect to it to send some messages. It'll just let you send them. If anyone's listening, they get them. If they're not, they don't. So the kind of example that makes sense is something like a, a web chat. In a web chat, you've got messages going into a point, and then they need to be distributed out to all connected clients. So um, I knocked up a little one just using a forever iframe. Um, but obviously, if you're, um, if you're in the HTML5 and CSS3 thing, you'd probably be using WebSockets um, or JS sockets or whatever you want. I mean, what you communicate to the client with doesn't make a great deal of difference. Because the architecture is, is roughly the same either way. You're going to be sending a message from one of your clients. So down here, we've got perhaps our web clients. They're going to send a message to a server that's going to fire it off to this distribution point that's going to distribute it to all of its subscribers, and they're going to push it over to their connected web clients. So the server is really easy. So all we're going to do is have a pull socket. So like the pipeline example before, we're just going to collect work in. And then we're going to publish it out a pub socket. Simple. The sender, this is a one-time script. So this one has got a while true in there. It's just going to loop. It's going to wait for new messages to come in. It's going to send them out the pub. The sender is a one-time. It's going to create a socket, connect it to a port, and fire the message across it. And we can do whatever we want in here. I mean, it's doing a little thing to say someone has joined, but it doesn't matter. It can process it however it wants. It just needs to correct, connect a push socket to the port it knows about. And then finally, you have the chat script. So the chat script will be what was loaded in the forever iframe. So um, for anyone that hasn't seen that, that's just the idea of having a hidden iframe with a script that never ends. So you can spam JavaScript at it, and it'll, the browser will update instantly. Um, so this uh, is of the actual subscriber part. So we've got a sub socket type, and then we actually have to say what we're subscribing to. Because ZeroMQ lets you do some message matching when you're subscribing. And it effectively is going to match on the start of the message. 
This lets you do um, some really cool things. If you know all your messages are prefixed with something, you can have separate uh, channels and readers for it. In our chat example, maybe you would have the actual name of the channel um, as the first message, and then you could subscribe just the channels you're on. In this case, we're passing blank. That means subscribe to every channel. So we're going to use a poll because um, we want to time out occasionally just so that we can flush some output to the browser so that PHP knows whether it's still there or not. But that's about it. This is pretty much all the code. All that's left is a, a bit of JavaScript. Um, so again, hopefully, we have to start the server. So the server becomes our stable part of our architecture. Then we have to, uh, in our web client, it just wants a name. Hopefully this will work. Ian, join. Let's put a name here. Uh, Tony, I don't know. Tony has joined. So um, we can chat, and that should just uh, turn up in the other window. Um, doing a talk. Um, and that will just turn up in the other window as long as you want. Uh, it's pretty straightforward um, bit of code, but this will scale really nicely because uh, our publisher here is doing so little work, it's, you're almost never going to be able to overhit that unless you're pushing a lot of messages in it. And even if you do, you can have your subscriber connect to multiple publishers. And so it can receive messages from many servers, and you can easily build a ring of them by having another push-pull pair that can let you sync up between them. So let me just kill off the subscriber there. So another thing you can do, because you've got that subscription filtering, is actually invert the whole thing. So let's say that you're doing some nice cache expiry, and you have a um, graceful bit of sort of ability to serve stale cache. So rather than just using your memcache expiry, you're actually embedding a date in there. When that date is hit, then instead of deleting it from the memcache, it continues to serve the old data, but sends a message saying, hey, I need new data. That's really good. It means it's going to... Uh, scale better, it means you're not going to suddenly have a cache stampede if all your stuff expires. So we can use 0MQ to do that messaging between them, but this time we'll use a publisher at each of the web clients. So this will be a sort of transient publisher. It'll pop up, it'll connect to subscribers, and it'll publish out to them. And we can have different subscribers for different types of data. So let's say that your user data is stored in a relational database, and your document data is stored over in a NoSQL. And you've got totally different hardware, you've got different demands, different requirements. You, you just want to balance it a completely different way. You can easily do that by just having a different subscriber for each. So here we're going to use Improc. We're assuming everything's on the same machine. You could use, uh, sorry, uh, Interprocess, because um, we're assuming everything's on the same machine. But we could easily use TCP or anything else. And we're just going to send a message out. And our message is going to be two parts. So the first part is what kind of data, and the second part is you know, maybe an ID. This is just generating some random data for us. The subscriber, then, for each would, um, would have code that looks something like this. We'd subscribe as before, and we'd set the socket option to what we wanted to subscribe to. So here we're just subscribing to everything that starts with users. So we've got that message on the top that says users. We know we can pull that, clear our cache, and process normally. And we will never get a receive if that subscription doesn't match. We will never get into it. We will just sit here until we get a message that starts with users. If a million messages go by that start with something else, we don't care. We don't know anything about it from the programming point of view. And we're binding this. So even though this is a sub-socket, we're being the stable part of the architecture. We're going to do the bind. And that's absolutely fine. There is no restrictions over which one connects and which one binds. You can do it any way around you want. If you want to have your reply sockets, um, connect and your request sockets bind, it's fine. Zero MQ does not limit you in any way. But there is something a bit annoying about this. And the slightly annoying thing is that, you know, let's say you've got users and data, your document data, and you want to add a third one. Well, all your clients now have to connect to that as well. It would be nice if they could just send it out. Um, and they can, but with a different type of transport. So we've looked at interprocess. So that's two processes talking to each other. And we've looked, well, many processes. And we've looked at TCP, which is usually different servers talking to each other. But there's a couple of other um, transport types built into 0MQ. Inproc, which is basically threads talking to each other within the same process, and PGM. So you can't see that. And PGM is uh, a multicast option. 
So PGM means you send one copy out and many receivers can listen to it. That's really cool, and it's really cool when you need a lot of data volume. Because if you, let's say that you're sending out pub sub like we were with a chat client over the network. So I send to one person, and I'm sending, I don't know, a meg of data a second. Now I send to a second person. I'm sending two meg of data a second. Third person, three meg of data a second. All of this stuff is going to add up, and maybe I can flood out my own network if I have enough traffic. The kind of people that have enough traffic are people like social networks. So if you're doing social networks, uh, you might need to have something that's collecting events. So you have people commenting and tagging and uploading. All of those things are triggering events. And then you have lots of people that, kind of like the chat example, are subscribing to those events. They're just going to have their page and they want it to update as the events come in, in real time. So to do that, you've got to push a lot of data out. And what multicast does <coughs> is rather than having the messages, rather than having the messages um, be sent out each time. It sends them out once, but it signals that there's a sequence in there. If that sequence number is missed, effectively, uh, the client calls back and say, hey, I didn't get that one, and it resends it for within a window of resending, which allows you the amount of network traffic you use to be significantly lower than uh, if you were um, sending a copy out to each one. So the kind of architecture you might use for something like this is, let's say that you have an event publisher there, and you have lots of clients, lots of clients sending stuff, people tagging things all over the place, many machines pushing into this one hub, and then it's using multicast to send it out. So it doesn't matter how many connected racks or servers or whatever, it's just sending it out, and they're all going to listen on it. And then each of them has another redistributor. So this is going to listen on that broadcast, and then rebroadcast it within the machine or within the rack or within whatever unit you choose to do, within the data center. Um, and then it can have multiple subscribers on it that will actually filter the subscriptions down to the stuff they're interested in. So you might have you know, a million user IDs being pushed through the event pub, and each subscriber at the end really only caring about 150 or whatever the average number of friends someone has. So you've got many, many less being worried about here, um, and you just want to have that work pretty transiently. And this is something that is easy to do in ZeroMQ. So here we're going to do our um, event publisher. So this is just like the chat server we had before. We're going to pull in uh, messages on a pull socket, and we're going to publish them back out. But rather than publishing on IP, uh, IPC, we're publishing on EPGM. So this is the multicast option that is transported over UDP. There's also PGM, which is transported over IP. We can specify an interface, so this uh, semicolon, before that you could put eth o or the IP of whichever interface you wanted. And in this case, I'm just saying use the first one. Then you put the multicast IP, because all multicasts in IP are in a certain address range. Um, and then you put the port. So you can still have multiple multicasts going over the same network, no problem. Um, and we're using a device here, because rather than writing that code to switch packets back and forth, we've just got a one-liner that says, I want a forwarder device. And that's actually going to do exactly the same thing. It's just written in C, and it's built in. And these devices, you can actually get a standalone little scripts. So while ZeroMQ doesn't uh, have a server, it does have standalone C versions of these devices, which you can configure and run. So you could replace this whole thing with uh, a little device that runs somewhere. The distributor, so we're going to say this is running on each server um, that's handling web clients, is going to do the same thing. We're going to subscribe, and we're going to subscribe to everything, so it's blank again. And then we're going to publish out through another publishing that is on a uh, IPC. So we're just going to take from the multicast and out over the IPC. Now, the reason we do this step is not because we can't listen on the multicast directly. We can. But it's because of slow subscribers. So if one of our web clients goes wrong or someone commits some dodgy code, and it starts taking a long time, it might, this one is going to have to hold more data to be able to publish it out if we decide we want pretty reliable um, delivery. So if we have a problem, we want that problem to be on that box and not all the way back to our central distribution point because that's got to keep going. It's got to keep throwing data out because it's not just web clients that are listening, it's the database, it's analytics, it's lots of other important stuff. So we have this extra step in there. And again, that's the idea of zero MQ. You build in as many little hops as you need, because they're cheap and they're simple. And then here's our fake client. 
So our fake client is just going to subscribe to 100 different random IDs. We can easily just do this subscribe as many times as we want. So if we want to subscribe to 1,000 different things, no problem. It all happens really fast. It uses good tree-based matching. Um, and then we're just going to connect to our uh, IPC, and then it's going to output some stuff. So this is going to work out of the box. These scripts will let you do that message distribution on any system that supports um, 0MQ and PGM. And with just on my little MacBook Air, bottom of the line MacBook Air, I was pushing uh, around 100,000 messages a minute between two different VMs running on this. If you're using proper hardware, um, you can push significantly more. And this is exactly the kind of thing you would be doing if you're pushing a lot of market data or other financial stuff like that. So one last um, area I want to look at, um, I hopefully find this interesting, is uh, Mongrel 2. Has anyone heard of Mongrel? Yeah, there's people there. So be a Mongrel, uh, web server out of the Ruby world, um, very popular. Big breakup between Zed Shaw and the uh, Rails community. And he started looking at building a new web server. So he's building this sort of web application server thing, and he wants it to be language agnostic. He doesn't want it to be tied to anything. And so rather than using uh, the same kind of things that Nginx or Lighty do and use fast CGI to talk to a process, so those web servers, you'll have your kind of application process, and you'll have your web server, and it'll talk to it over fast CGI. He decided to use 0MQ to do that, because then you get all the messages, uh, all the benefits of the messages. You can have routers in there. You can have clustering kind of built in, because it can go out over the network, or it can go in one machine. You get all the nice things, and you get the fact that it will work in any language that 0MQ works in. So if you really want to write a web, um, a web app in Arda or in Haskell, no problem, because they have 0MQ bindings. So um, what it actually does to achieve that is pushes to handlers. So every time it gets a web request, it's going to package that up and push that out to a handler, and it's going to listen on a subscribe socket for messages coming back in. And that's cool, because that allows you to do some clustering really easily. And it also allows you to do some really cool stuff with long polling. So this is about the simplest possible um, Mongol2 handler I could write. Um, all we're going to do is connect to the sockets that we've defined from Mongol2. So we're going over TCP, and we're just going to listen on our pull socket. So that's where the requests are going to come from. And we're going to send messages back on our pub socket. Um, here we've just got a bit of HTTP header. And when we get a message from Mongol2, it's going to tell us it, the ID of the server, the UUID. It's going to tell us the ID of the connection, uh, which is just ID in this example. It's going to tell us the path that was requested. So if we want to just say no, send out a redirect, we can do that quite quickly. Um, and then it's going to give us all the headers in a JSON encoded um, object, and it's going to give us the body. So you know, if anything was posted or anything that was sent across, you're going to get that whole lot there. So all we're going to do here is just pull out the server ID and the ID, and then our message that we want to send back and send those back. So we just say, this server, for this connection, send them this. A mongrel handles talking to the connection. So that means if we have 20 servers, we can just send out. And the right one will be listening with a subscription filter um, for its UUID at the start, which makes clustering kind of very easy. We don't have to worry about how many servers they are. We just know we're going to request that tells us who to reply to. So the config of that is, I mean, it's, it's quite long. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about it. But kind of at the top there, you can just about see those are standard 0MQ uh, addresses. So you can put any 0MQ address you want in there. You can have it go over different transport types. It's fine. And you can see what the identifier is of the server. So you can control all that from Mongo2. But you probably want something a bit more, a handle that's a bit more complex to build anything uh, interesting. And actually, um, Winx has done a uh, PHP 5.3 handler, which uses namespaces. Um, and it's a bit more verbose. But I just wanted to show you what kind of thing you could do with this handler and with Mongo2. So if we think about our chat example before, we were having a chat script running for each connected client. So if 10 of you are connected to my chat server, I would have chat.php running 10 times, serving up that iframe. That's fine, but if I'm running, say, 3 megs of memory per process, then that is going to run out eventually. I can only serve so many. But I'm not really doing anything most of the time. I'm just listening and sending messages out. So what we can do with this is run a single <coughs> chat.php 
and let Mongo handle which people we want to send it to. So here we're just going to connect to our, our subscribe socket. So this is where we're going to subscribe to the chat messages. And we're going to connect to uh, our Mongol socket. Um, and that is going to, we're going to poll both of them. So we're going to be looking for any messages coming from Mongol or any messages coming from the chat server. And then the actual work of it is just this loop here. So down the bottom, if we get a message from Mongol, we're just going to get the sender out of it and we're going to store it. So we're going to have a list of all the connected people. And sometimes it's going to send a disconnected messages. If the client goes away, it's just going to send us a disconnected message. So we're going to remove that ID. So what we're going to have is an array with all the IDs of people connected. Then at the top, if we get any uh, messages in from our chat server, we're just going to put it in the JavaScript as before and send it to all of those IDs. So we send the one message and we just say, we'd like you to go to these 10 IDs, and Mongol handles firing it out to the right servers. So that means our memory usage to run this uh, chat server has just massively diminished and we can serve many, many more clients. And because Mongol's event-based, pretty efficient, it doesn't really use up a lot of uh, space either. So um, that's about it from me. Um, there are some helpful links here. Um, we'll do a bit of questions after if they don't have any. ZeroMQ is the community site. Have a look, see if there's anything interesting there. Um, the Z guide is the best thing to look at if you want to learn more. It's an in process of being written book that is going to tell you all about uh, ZeroMQ, uh, all about reliability patterns, and really get into the details of it. The code from this talk is there on GitHub. Um, I will put the slides on SlideShare and that link will be tweeted about. Um, and I'd love it. Please do feedback on joined in. I'd love to know. Uh, what you think of ZeroMQ, the talk, and anything else, because I think this is a really great way of building systems that do more than just the regular um, LAMP stack. I think it's the easiest way I've encountered, and I really hope uh, it's going to do something for you. So um, thank you. Any questions? Uh, OK. Tom. The last slide you put up for the chat server. The last slide you put up for the chat server. Well, I'm right in thinking you could have multiple ones of those running simultaneously. Yeah, absolutely. And it would just send to one of them. So if one of them did crash, another one could pick it up. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's very easy to, um, to do that in almost any sense of uh, you have multiple bits of redundancy in there. Because ZeroMQ will just happily let you connect as many as you want or bind as many as you want, you can just fire in, uh, you can just have multiple of the same thing running and you get your redundancy. So anytime you've got a stable part like that, like that server, just think, oh, I need two. So fine, just have two. And all the guys listen on both. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great. Cool. Uh, I think, yeah, yeah. Um, is there anything built in into Zero, um, ZeroMQ to monitor the uh, the queues itself to find out whether they stack up or not? Um, the, there are a few mechanisms in ZeroMQ. So part of the general architecture of ZeroMQ itself as a library is that it does not want you to worry about what it's doing. So um, it doesn't want you to worry about whether the client's there or server's there or not. It'll just deliver it when it can. So for its internal queues, the ones you get built in when you're sending or when you're receiving, um, the only monitoring you can do is by setting a high watermark, which is the maximum number it will have in it, um, and by setting a low watermark, which is when it will start accepting things again. If you're building a queue like the one we saw that was just swapping packets back and forth, messages back and forth, then yeah, you can easily put in more monitoring there. You can easily do whatever you want. Um, Miko actually has a bit of a project he'd started on, which was uh, saving off the messages into Kyoto Cabinet um, so that you can get you know, a copy of them somewhere. Um, you can easily add that kind of stuff in because you've only got really four or five lines of zero and Q code, and after that, it's application code. Cool. Anyone else? Is there any form of persistence for the queues? So if the stable part becomes unstable and falls over? Yeah. Um, in general, no. So um, you can, when you hit that high watermark of having too many messages, you can set up swap so it'll write to disk. Um, so that you can allow yourself to handle more messages. But built in, there's nothing in there to, say, save them to a database or um, save them out to a file, that kind of thing. One of the reasons behind that is that um, if you have big chains of these things, they break. Um, they break because someone's going slow and you can't, your persistence isn't quite good enough. So reliability is very, very tricky on that point of view because let's say that you wanted to be sure, hey, my queue will definitely have the message. You send the message to your queue. Um, 
Well, the only way you can be sure it has it is if it does a reply. So you'd use a request reply. But what if your network loses that reply packet? It might actually have it. So you then maybe have to, um, if you don't get that in a certain time, send a Ken, and you can actually really slow down your whole system, trying to build in more and more reliability. So it went with another quote from uh, John Gifford, actually. He said, zero and Q goes with the sort of Formula One philosophy. Start with something fast and make it reliable, rather than start with something reliable and try and make it fast. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I must admit, I don't. So the question was whether I knew much about um, the telehash peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, which is, uh, I've forgotten the guy's name, the guy who came up with, yeah, XMPP. Um, I, don't, I don't know a lot about it, to be honest. Uh, I, it, it's likely to be cool, because XMPP is pretty cool. Um, there are other protocols that do messaging systems. And sometimes there are things that can talk both, like there is a protocol called um, AMQP, which is the Advanced Message Queue Protocol, and that was, that's, a lot of banks use that. And like, you can get something like RabbitMQ, which can talk both AMQP and ZeroMQ, so you can kind of build stuff in together if you need to. But no, I don't have any specific stuff about Telehash, unfortunately. I actually... <laughs> Do it. I actually remember using um, a, a web server from iMatics back oh, in the 80s. Yeah, um, Zaitami or whatever their name is back then. Yeah, back. yeah. And uh, AMQP was actually written by the same people. Yes. Zero MQ is AMQP done right. Yes, that's exactly it. So yeah, um, AMQP was by the guys that went on to do Zero MQ. And basically, Zero MQ is them trying to fix all the problems they encountered in AMQP. Uh, yeah, I think I forgot. Hi. Um, okay. I love Sorry. zero MQ. I'm building a small app myself with it. Awesome. It's very good. Um, well, one thing I just want some more of a comment. Maybe you could comment on it. Is sure. you, the fact that you can write a C um, zero MQ process really easily, much more easily than running a C extension, mm -hmm. and also the fact that you can get around that there are no threads, real threads in PHP. Yeah. So you can just write multiple processes or throw it or in different languages, whether PHP or C, really easily. Yeah, yeah, so. absolutely. I mean, yeah, that's absolutely right. It's because it's a very easy way to plug different languages. Any of these examples could have been in any language. Um, because it's really easy to plug them in, you often find you would do a service where you would have maybe tried to do something in PHP yourself um, because it's so trivial. And if you do need to scale out, because they do let you synchronize multiple processes easily, push data between multiple processes, you can have you could do multiprocessing where it would have been hard. And particularly if you do uh, any work in a language which is threaded, as you say, um, data being shared between threads is where you hit all of your problems with speed when you go to multi-threading. And ZeroMQ is a great way to do that because you can send messages between threads. You can send a pointer between threads with the messages. Cool. Um, anything else? No, uh, I think that's it then. Well, thank you very much.